Nervous, relaxed, aggressive, stable, agile, boring, fast, or slow. However you want to describe the handling of a bike, it does seem that it is always lumped into one of two categories based on its geometry. That combination of angles and dimensions is probably the single most important thing that governs how a bike feels to ride. Now, I don't know whether this split is down to bike manufacturers actually building bikes to fit into distinct categories like race bikes or endurance bikes, or whether it's down to the people whose job it is to actually describe the way those bikes feel actually struggling to do so, but yet still needing to summarize it for our benefit. Now, I did think that despite having forgotten everything I'd ever learned at school about geometry, I did understand bikes, or at least I understood what I liked, which is aggressive, fast handling, responsive bikes with short wheelbases and short chainstays. But then, a few months back, this bike turned up and it's got me rethinking everything that I thought I knew. So I'm off to get a lesson, and I thought you might be interested in joining, because to help us pick this subject apart, we're once again visiting Tom Sturdy, a Jedi of bike building, and conveniently based just down the road at the Bicycle Academy, where he teaches people how to hand build bike frames, as well as making his own. Tom, I have brought you two very different bikes. I love them both equally, but they are so different from one another. The Canyon Air Road, I guess you'd call your typical kind of fast feeling bike, aggressive geometry, although it's not confined to a racetrack. I mean, I ridden it for 400 kilometers as happily as it's possible to ride 400 kilometers and also ridden up the Angaroo, you know, so it's not just a, an out and out aero bike. The track, meanwhile, at the opposite end of the spectrum would be your quintessential stable bike on paper, but yet yeah, it's also hugely fast and also incredibly fun as well. And coincidentally, both bikes have been ridden to victory at the Tour of Flanders, so they've got pedigree in the same difficult race. So I was really hoping that you'd be able to help us kind of unpick this whole fast versus slow geometry thing. I mean, what actually does govern the feel of a bike and can it affect how fast or slow it is? Sure, so what we'll do is we'll have a look at each of these bikes individually and take some measurements to work out what the geometry is um, so we can look at that in detail. Great stuff. Okay, Tom, let's go over some of the most important dimensions then that we're gonna be discussing in respect to, to bike handling then. We've got, what, bottom bracket drop? That's one of the keys? Yep, so we're gonna measure how, um, how low the bottom bracket is relative to the axles of the wheel. So that's what we're referring to with bottom bracket drop. Uh, so we've got um, a, a laser line here, which is uh, at the same horizontal height as the center of the front and rear axle. Uh, and I can measure to the outermost edge uh, of this circle here. Uh, and get a bottom bracket drop of 73 millimeters. Okay, and what does, what does bottom bracket drop actually affect when we're talking about bike handling? So what we're doing with the bottom, your, your, your riding position is all going to be referenced from that bottom bracket yeah. center. Um, and so by lowering the bottom bracket further down, you're going to then ultimately lower the saddle and the handlebars correspondingly. So you're going to lower the center of gravity of the rider and the bike, which is going to put the, um, the center of gravity closer to its footprint or the vehicle's footprint, which is the, the contact patches of the tire. Okay, because commonly if you look at a high school physics textbook, which I have to do regularly to try and understand things, uh, it will say that a higher center of gravity makes an object more stable, but in the context of a bike, actually the opposite is true. So it can be, uh, it, it, also, it all depends on how the, how the object is standing or, or, in, or balancing, um, uh, because the way that a bike stays upright is actually by constantly nearly falling over. So uh, as, the, as, as, as its center of gravity moves outside of its contact patch or footprint, um, the vehicle will start to fall in one direction and then the steering geometry will 
allow the wheel to rotate in that direction, which allows its footprint to get back underneath itself. Um, a bit like balancing something on your fingers, you have to constantly move. Right, next one then, we're going to go for chainstay length, yep. sometimes called rear centre. That's right, so um, on most um, geometry charts that you might read from a, published by a manufacturer, the, the chainstay length is going to be a measurement of uh, a simple straight line measurement from the centre of the bottom bracket here to the centre of the rear axle here. Um, another alternative measurement that people might use is that distance but in a horizontal direction, um, although that's less common. Now, chainstay length is something that I have tended to latch onto as a measure of whether or not I think I might like a bike, but what does it actually affect when it comes to handling? It's important to consider the chainstay length with some other dimension, so as part of the, the total wheelbase uh, uh, and indeed compared to its opposite measurement, so the front centre. Um, but you're controlling how, how close the rear wheel is up underneath your position. Um, and so by having a short um, change there, the bike's generally going to feel more snappy, um, more lively. When we look at the steering geometry, the, the key things that we're, uh, we're looking at, um, one of the first ones is the head tube angle. Um, and so that's the angle uh, that the steerer tube or the steering axis is relative to a, a horizontal. So most road bikes sit somewhere between 72 and 74 degrees. Um, and that's quite standard for most road bikes. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is what you mentioned as uh, the, the, the rake or the offset of the fork, and that is how far forwards, typically, of that steering axis the axle is held. And what those two dimensions do is that they create a, a projected measurement along the ground, which is called trail, um, or sometimes referred to as mechanical trail. Uh, and that gives the front wheel predictable rotational stability. So by having that measurement there, it means that the contact patch of the tire will always trail behind the steering axis of the bike. The more trail you have, the more quickly the, the um, front end of the bike will, will react to any change. So arguably that's more stable, but what we really are interested in here in terms of how the vehicle feels is that the trail is largely, or, or, or the, the magnitude of the trail and the weight that acts over it really controls what you feel through the bars. Right, back with our two original bikes then, Tom. So let's talk through the differences then and why why they do feel so different, but yet ultimately still deliver the same thing, which is fast and fun. Yeah. Um, so these are actually quite significantly different. If you were to you know, take your, your, your standard kind of fast uh, road bike, that what most people would refer to as that, that's what you'd get as yeah. a canyon. Um, the Trek has got uh, a quite significantly longer wheelbase. Uh, uh, it's also got uh, a lower bottom bracket. Um, a slacker head tube angle, but interestingly, it has much more rake in the fork. So it's got those hallmarks of a stable bike, so long wheelbase, long front centre, low bottom bracket, long chain stays, but that trail begins to offset that. So that's why it feels both stable and yet also responsive at the same time. Yeah, that's right. So, so in terms of the, the kind of vehicle dynamics, um, this is definitely has got much more directional stability from the longer wheelbase. Um, you're right, the, the slacker head angle, or the combination of the slacker head angle and um, more offset in the fork means that the front centre is quite long. Um, uh, and so, yes, you're, you're looking at something that on paper is much more stable, but the sensation that you get from riding it isn't necessarily fully in line with that and a lot of that's to do with the fact that they have, have done that in combination with less trail um, uh, which, which effectively gives you a little bit less feedback through the handlebars and puts you more in control of the handlebars rather than the bike doing things. So not a conventionally stable bike then, you know, it was designed with the particular needs of Fabio Cancellara in mind I, I think, so it's a, it's a stable bike that also required rider input. 
if we're taking the canyon then as our traditional race bike geometry, why do you think we've arrived at this collection of angles and dimensions that, that requires that, that rider input? I mean, it, it feels fast. I think that really hits the nail on the head is that a, a big part of riding a bike uh, and enjoying riding a bike is getting the right feeling from that bike. Uh, and, and a bike with a short wheelbase or relatively short wheelbase is going to be one that it, it, it deliberately doesn't have much directional stability. So it will change direction very readily, very quickly. And that's very much what we expect of a, a racing road bike. Um, you know, short, very short chain stays or, or you know, typically um, road bikes will have as short a chain stay as possible. Again, snappy, fast accelerating. It's, it's all things that we expect to feel when we ride a race bike. Slightly steeper head angle, which means um, that the, 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 there is less what's known as wheel flop as the bike leans from one side to the other. Um, uh, sort of faster steering, if you like. So everything, it, it feels quite fast and snappy and racy. Um, uh, and, and yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head really, is that it, it, it's creating a certain sensation, if you like, for the rider, which is what we have come to expect of a race bike. It's interesting, isn't it? Because so much of what we're told about why a bike has been designed in a certain way is with speed in mind. So for example, again, we're taking that canyon, it's an aerodynamic bike, which means it is literally faster. You can go faster for the same effort. Uh, and it's lightweight, which also means that you can go faster uh, and it's stiff and whatever else. But the geometry has almost been designed separately to reward the rider in a different way. So, so the geometry makes you feel like you're going fast, even if you're not actually going fast. Is that a fair assessment? I think so, yeah. Um, uh, and that doesn't necessarily make it a good or a bad thing. Um, it's just a thing. Uh, so, so for some people, the fact that they feel like they're going fast might actually make them go faster. And you know, the really complicated thing about bikes is, is the human riding them, actually, um, and, and how they ride a bike what they enjoy doing when they ride a bike, uh, how they produce power, how they steer, how they brake, all of these things will have a really meaningful impact on the overall experience. Um, and sometimes creating a certain sensation is what makes a bike a good or a bad bike. And it could be very different for one individual to another. Is it fair to say then that in when you look at bike geometry is, is a bigger picture. Actually, there's as much philosophy there as there is actual engineering. Once you've got your, your basic set of parameters, whether the head angle is 72 or 74 and the trail is 43 or 49 or whatever, it, it is then a case of actually more about the feel of the bike than, you know, than the speed. It, it, bike geometry has no effect on aerodynamics, presumably, and it's got no effect on how fast you can ride in a sprint. No, it, I mean, there are ways in which it could affect it slightly. So, for example, by lowering the bottom bracket, you have the facility to lower the whole rider, which, which will have a small impact on, on their, their kind of frontal area, which is a key driver for, um, for their coefficient of drag. Um, so there are small things that the geometry could provide, but by and large, the, the, um, what's safe to say is that what you are influencing by changing the geometry of the two bikes is what the rider is going to feel, how that vehicle is going to handle, um, and, and therefore what experience the rider is going to get from being out on the road and you know, climbing or descending at speed or just plowing along on the flat. The, the weight of the rider is always going to be the most significant weight on the vehicle, and, and so small changes in where that rider is, um, and it's normally the most powerful measurement is, is where your saddle is in relation to the bottom bracket. Um, anything that you do that, that moves the, the rider's centre of gravity forwards or backwards is going to have a big influence on how the bike handles. So you could have exactly the same bike uh, and if you were, for example, to, to switch between a, a seat post that had layback and one that didn't and, and adjust the position on exactly the same bike accordingly, the feedback that you would get from that bike, the, the, the way that bike would handle out on the road would be significantly different simply because you've moved your weight. Okay. And so yes, if, if the rider is, if one rider has a particularly long torso and there has, therefore has more weight over the front of the bike, any given bike will feel different to someone who's the opposite. Okay, I feel like I've come here 
in search of answers and I've opened a can of worms. So rather than leave the viewers with this grappling with a philosophical question, what about some, some practical advice? And if someone is looking to buy a new bike and before they take them for a test ride or if that's not possible and they're looking at geometry charts, what, what are the actual key things that you can look for to say, okay, that I think is a bike that I'm going to enjoy riding? Um, sure. So it, it, it can be quite a daunting question. I think um, for any viewers who are asking that question, it's most easy to do if you have some sort of frame of reference. So let's say you have an existing bike and you know how that feels to ride. You can then look at some geometry charts and look at some of those key measurements that we talked about, like the wheelbase, the bottom bracket drop the front center, the rear center, the head angle, the trail, all of those numbers, um, well, most of them are readily available on a geometry chart. And you can compare that to what you know, compare that to what you have currently, and that will enable you to make some decisions. So for example, if the bike that you have currently, uh, you find that it is too agile, too twitchy, you want something with more stability, then you're looking for something with a longer wheelbase, lower bottom bracket, a longer front center, that sort of thing. Um, so you can use the, the geometry, um, you know, there are certain knowns that there is no way that a bike with a longer wheelbase is more agile than one with a shorter wheelbase, for example. Um, but ultimately, unless you have a frame of reference as to how that feels for you versus for myself or, or for someone else, then um, it's quite difficult to make that decision. So. The short answer is there's no substitute for doing it, for having a, yeah, having a go on the bike that you ultimately want to buy. Um, but if you have that frame of reference, then that's a really good starting point. Cool. Tom, as always, thank you very much, mate. That was You're brilliant. welcome. I have in my hands a follow-up video. These are two frames that were built here at the Bicycle Academy, and they have almost identical geometry, except with the relevant forks plugged into the front end, we'll have wildly different trails. So when built up, we're gonna be able to neatly illustrate one of the points that Tom has just been talking about. So watch this space. In the meantime, please give this video a big thumbs up. Say thank you very much to Tom. And if you would like to see another video filmed right here actually, where we throw a little bit of doubt over the question of frame stiffness and mechanical efficiency, you can click on screen now.